only a third of central banks are BIS members and two thirds are not, and they get screwed by the one thirds who are. So there's all these CBDC, central bank issued digital currencies. We think of the Bank of China, we think of the Federal Reserve, but Angola and Zimbabwe and all these other guys who say, hey, how about we get some fairness finally? So if they don't get it from BIS, they're gonna create their own rails and they're gonna be using our technology to create those types of rails. So uh, three to five years, all that's coming. And that'll lead to the next wave, the next wave. And within 20 years, I think it's inevitable. In this video, the CEO and founder of IOHK, Charles Hoskinson, speaks on the progress of Cardano and how the scalability, sustainability, and interoperability makes it a leader among all its competitors. He discusses how the Cardano protocols will allow you to manage and transform identity and governance, and why Cardano will create an equitable financial system mainly for people in the third world countries. Make sure to stick around till the end of this video, where I will share some latest technical chart analysis and ADA price forecast. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our recent videos. It will take a moment and it's absolutely free. Now, let's enjoy the video. I think there are a lot of people out there right now uh, who have just started to get their head around what Bitcoin is and potentially around what Ethereum is. They understand uh, it's a digital uh, store of value, kind of uh, a metaphor for gold. They understand smart contracts or the ability to execute code on a blockchain. What is it exactly that Cardano does for people who are not uh, eyeball deep in the digital asset space? Yeah, so basically it's just a collection of protocols and technology that allows you to transform, store, and manage value, identity, and governance. So if you have an instrument of value, that could be a stock, a bond, a commodity, a token, an NFT, like a Pokemon card. It doesn't really matter. You, you need some place to store it, transmit it, you need some place to build contractual relationships around it. Like I'll give you my Pokemon cards if you uh, mow my lawn, that type of a deal. Okay. Identity is who are you? Normally we take that for granted. Oh, I have a passport, I have a driver's license, but you have credit score. Is it a fair credit score? Maybe, maybe not. Um, for some bizarre reason, my secretary has a higher credit score than I do and I'm a billionaire. So I'm just trying to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, but it's, so there's, there's something about that system that doesn't seem intrinsically right, but okay. Um, and so there's a lot of these things that make a lot of sense in how identity is brokered and handled in our world, but in the developing world, it's non-existent in many places. There's tons of people there that are brilliant, that are honest, that are very hardworking, and they are completely shut off from the global economy because there's no way to assess whether that counterparty is rep reputable, trustworthy. Like, for example, microfinance. Uh, let's say some guy runs a farm and says, I want $200, $300 uh, for uh, you know a loan for fertilizer. And if I do this, I can upgrade my farm, get much better yields, and I'll make windfall money, and I'll be able to pay that back. He said, great, 85% interest. He said, oh God, that's that's usurious. I said, well, how do I trust the counterparty? How do I know you're actually gonna pay me back? The default rate may be high, maybe low. There's no credit systems in a lot of these places. No. So identity is a huge problem. And that's why 3 billion people are under or unbanked in the entire world. And that's why remittances are 15%. That's why microfinance is so expensive. That's why we don't have good insurance markets in these places to protect people on the downside. So we need an engine for identity. And then finally for governance, how do you govern things? Like for example, these transnational trade agreements. Uh, look at, I was just at a meeting with a major telco and we were talking, complaining about Verizon and Sprint and T-Mobile uh, and these agreements for roaming and these agreements for brokering data capacity amongst the networks and it's just, very ossified. So what happens when those telcos want to meet with Mobicom in Mongolia? What happens when those telecoms want to go meet with uh, people in the UK or across the world? How do they broker transnational agreements? Is there just going to be one universal government to decide how telecommunications should work? Is the ITU going to somehow be in charge of every teleco in the world? No. You have to broker trust relationships between these entities to be able to move subscribers and data and other such things between networks because we travel. If I land in Heathrow, I'd like when I turn my phone on for my phone to work. And it shouldn't take 500 lawyers and billions of dollars to make such an arrangement work. It should be seamless from one system to another system. And that's where there's Fortune 500. What about medical records? You know, I've been 52 countries in the last few years and I'm thinking, gosh, what if I got in a car accident in Tanzania and I'm unconscious? 
and this Tanzanian doctor calls my doctor in, in Colorado and says, hey, uh, Charles is unconscious, but I need all of his medical records because I'm trying to treat him. No, trust me, I'm, I'm real and legit. Uh, he can't talk to you though, because he's unconscious. How does he get my medical records to treat me? I could be un, uh, gone for days and there might be vital information there. So there's just a simple problem brokering the movement of medical records from one country to another country. And that's the point of these protocols is that there's a million of these problems, whether it be the adulteration of drugs, uh, you know, like Mongolia, a third of all the medicine in that country is in some way bad, it could be expired or mislabeled or counterfeit. So if you're trying to take an antibiotic, you have one, three chance of getting a bad pill. That's a problem. And the point of our industry, this technology is to say, it's a Swiss army knife of protocols where you can build applications on top of it that handle that brokering of value, identity, and governance so that you can solve real problems. And you can solve them in a way where everybody participating in them, they all know the rules up front, okay? They don't have a situation where one party knows more than another party. There's no information asymmetry. They don't have a situation where there's a gatekeeper who can shut you out, even in the social media side of things, the deplatforming. The reason that happens is the social networks are the boat and the river. They are the ones who get you into the flow of information, but they also own the river. So they get to decide which boats get to sail there. So if you're on Twitter and you get deplatformed, you lose access to the entire Twitter network and you're no longer a member of that massive community. The same for Facebook or so forth. And it's even worse that the places where they're not the river, they cooperate with each other. And they'll say, well, if somebody competes with us and we don't like their values, we're gonna get to platform them so they have no marketplace. That's because the protocols are the companies together. And wherever you fall politically on that, maybe you're a winner in that, maybe you're a loser in that, but it's a real bad idea in society for only a small group of companies to have so much control over so many people and be unelected and unaccountable to the democratic process. And so the point of this protocol approach is saying, Let's reimagine these things where we separate the boats from the river. Let's reimagine these things where we start with the trust relationships and say, what are the rules for everybody? And then how do we broker the flow of information and value? And how do we govern that in a way that's equally fair to everyone? And then you could build solutions on top of it. And then suddenly you have medicine that's not adulterated. And suddenly you can have freedom of speech that's important to you. Suddenly, you can now have a situation where you can get a loan that doesn't cost 85% interest. Suddenly, you can get remittances where you can instantly move money to your family back in Mexico City or in Cebu, and it doesn't cost you $15 to move $100. It costs you five pennies. In terms of pragmatically, where are we right now with Cardano in the process of realizing that vision? What's great is there's a lot of competitors. There's Algorand and Tezos, and there's F2 and so forth. and all of us are kind of scratching at the same things. And, and that's great because these are strength in numbers and they have different philosophies and teams and scientific approaches. And so somebody's gonna get it done. Cardano, I think is the leader right now in terms of, because we, we did the deep investments in science and we did the deep investments in proper engineering and we have market access to the places where I think this is going to shine the brightest. As I said, I'm not here to make the 17 year old yield farmer in his mom's basement in New Jersey rich. I mean, he'll figure it out for himself he's okay uh, I'm worried about the farmer in Ethiopia but you know regardless of where you fall in the spectrum there's enough people here that we're starting to see very real progress on scalability sustainability and interoperability there's protocols like Nipa POWs and a lot of cool sidechain protocols that exist to move value and information between systems the Oracle systems like Chainlink and so forth have really evolved and they've gotten to a point where they're starting to become great protocols and the next generation of them are going to be phenomenal. We have a process to gradually move in the right direction and there's going to be a lot of setbacks and failures and so forth. But real use and utility, that's going to be happening at scale, I think, in three to five years where millions of people are going to earn their living working in this industry and it's sustainable. Millions of people will be getting loans from this industry on a regular basis. Millions of people getting their insurance policy from this. Billions, if not trillions of dollars will be moved in remittances every year through this system on its rails at a super low cost. That's three to five years, I think. That's inevitable. And also you're going to see institutional competition. Only a third of central banks are BIS members uh, and two thirds are not. And they get screwed by the one thirds who are. So there's all these CBDC, central bank issued digital currencies. We think of the Bank of China, we think of the Federal Reserve, but Angola and Zimbabwe and all these other guys who say, hey, how about we get some fairness finally? So if they don't get it from BIS, they're gonna create their own rails and they're gonna be using our technology to create those types of rails. So uh, three to five years, all that's coming and that'll lead to the next wave and the next wave. And within 20 years, I think it's inevitable.
And there you have it, what Charles Hoskinson had to say about Cardano. Now, let's move on towards ADA price forecast. If we look at the 4-hour chart, we see that the Cardano has found a major resistance at $1.35.52 level. At the same time, Cardano has formed a bullish pennant pattern that is shown in black. This pattern tends to lead to a bullish breakout. Like VeChain, this pattern has happened at the 38.2% retracement level. Therefore, in my view, the Cardano price will have a bullish breakout, with the initial target being the 23.6% retracement level at $1.40.8, which is about 5% above the current level. And realistically, this prediction will be invalidated if it moves below the support at $1.25. And this is all for today's video. Let me know what you guys think about this price forecast and what will happen to Cardano in the future. Share your thoughts in the comments and I'll see you in my next video. Thanks for watching.